Hello and welcome to Capital Market Live on Channel Television. I'm Laddie Williams. First things first, let's take a look at um, global markets, see how they ended uh, the week uh, starting uh, right there in Europe. We see European markets uh, close higher uh, on Friday after U.S. lawmakers passed a bill to raise the debt ceiling and uh, cap government spending for two years, just days before the default deadline. Uh, the FTSE 100, that rose by over 1.5%, while France's CAC index uh, climbed by 1.87%, and the German DAX uh, rose by 1.25%. Meanwhile, in the economic front, uh, recent comments from ECB officials have indicated the central bank may opt to skip another hike at its June meeting. And Asia-Pacific shares uh, mostly rose as traders uh, look ahead to the U.S. Uh, did uh, look for that uh, U.S. job support uh, with Hong Kong's uh, Hang Seng Index trading as high as 4% and leading gains in the region. In mainland China, the Shanghai Composite added 0.79% to close at 3,230 points, while in Japan, the Nikkei 225 uh, traded up 1.21% at 31,000 524 points. Uh, to U.S. markets now, I will see the Dow Jones Industrial Average surged uh, on Friday for its best day since January as traders chaired a strong jobs report and the passage of a debt ceiling bill that averts a U.S. default. At the 30 stock Dow jumped 701.19 points to end at 33,762 points. The S&P 500 climbed 1.45% to close at 4,282 points. The Nasdaq Composite advanced 1.07% as close to 13,240 points, uh, reaching its highest level since April 2022. With Friday's gains, the S&P 500 and Nasdaq finished the holiday shortened trading week about one8 and 2% higher. And uh, back here, the bullish uh, momentum in local bourse accelerated as investors hunted for bargains following positive reactions uh, to President Tinubu's inaugural speech. Intense buying activities on the first trading session of the holiday shortened week uh, resulted in the market recording its biggest single-day gain since November the 12th, uh, 2020, so about 6.2%. Uh, this uh, contributed to the all-share index ending the week in the green. Uh, closing higher by about 5.4 percent week on week at 55,822 points, with a year-to-day return for the index increasing to 8.9 percent. Investors' interest in big caps such as MTN Nigeria, Dangote Cement, and Boa Foods boosted the positive performance. Activity level was positive as trading volume and value grew by 31.1 percent and 37.0 percent week on week. Also, performance across sectors was positive as the oil and gas index topped the chart, followed by the consumer goods, industrial goods, banking, and insurance indexes. Corn oil emerged top gainer for the week as the stock price surged by 45.78%, while tantalizers uh, led to decliners. While the banking sector dominated top trades for the week, with Axis Holdings in the lead. And the positive sentiment were also seen in unlisted equities market. The NAS, the OTC index, and the market value appreciated by more than 2% to end the week. Similarly, the market saw a surge in total turnover of transactions as volume traded increased by 1,300%, 1, while value jumped more than 1,700%. NAS, the PLC, led the top gainers for the week, followed by Central Securities uh, Clearing System and Friesland Campina. And the UBN property was the sole loser this week as it topped trades by volume uh, due to sell pressure. All right, joining me now for analysis, we have Onose Asote and now our investment analyst, Main Street um, Capital, to give us a review of the local equities market right here. Great to have you on the show. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Ladi. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. So quite a big jump uh, we saw for the first trading day um, this week. What do you think got investors so bullish? Uh, well, um, like you said earlier, it's, it was the uh, the president's you know inaugural speech. Um, so now, one thing about the stock market is it tends to reflect um, more of investors' expectations than you know current realities. And um, given some of the new president's economic policies, you know, um, for example, uh, we see the removal of oil subsidy. Um, the unification of the exchange rates, um, repatriation of, you know, um, um, foreign funds back to foreign companies, um, reducing um, um, 
interest rates. Um, those things are positive for businesses, you know, um, in the long run. And so um, investors are looking at it and they're seeing, okay, um, if there's a unification of interest rates, um, that might put less pressure, you know, on you know less FX demand, and um, it's make it easier. You know, FX um, FX exchange might come down and make it easier for imports, you know, expectations. Um, if you know the interest rates are reduced, then the cost of borrowing is cheaper. And so it makes it easier, you know, the cost of doing business is a bit cheaper and, you know, um, their profit margins could increase. So um, a lot of these things that, you know, the president was saying that, you know, he's going to do, um, they are really good for businesses. And so we investors are expecting that, okay, if, you know, the president really, you know, delivers on his policies, then uh, businesses in the long run or in the, in the short to midterm um, should do well. And we are now seeing those um, expectations reflect in the markets. Uh, I guess uh, some have tagged it, uh, uh, Tino Bull. But I I'm wondering, uh, did you guys expect, you know, this kind of jump, you know, after uh, the inauguration? Was it something that, you know, uh, most of you actually saw coming? Um, not at this scale. Um, we, we know that um, he had been playing with the idea of subsidy removal. Um, so we expected to see something in the oil and gas, you know, um, um, sector. Um, which we saw last week, um, but not at the scale that, you know, at which he did it. Because um, um, if we're being frank, I guess maybe some of the things he said, um, uh, some of them came as, um, I wouldn't say a shock, but um, it was the way he said some things. You know, um, if perhaps he had been a bit, um, um, he had said things in a different way or in a different manner, maybe we wouldn't have seen the spike. Uh, but he kind of, um, like he said in his in his campaign, he hit the ground running, um, and we saw that in his speech. And so that kind of um, that kind of shock is 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 now what we saw, you know, reflected in the market. You know, so we did see you know something like this happening, but just not at this scale, and not just you know not not this really sharp move that you know we ended up seeing. And looking at consequent days after that sharp move um, up, it was more of marginal gains uh, we saw. What does that tell us? Uh, well, that tells us that one, the people who were uh, possibly already in certain positions, because I know even over even over here at my firm, who were already in certain positions that kind of spiked up. Um, we would not expect people to now want to really pile in to buy, you know, after that initial spike, until something else, perhaps something a bit more fundamental, happens to now kind of bring back interest into those stocks. Um, so if you look at the charts for stocks like um, Zenith and um, UCAP. Uh, we actually saw some sales, you know, um, especially on Friday, you know, so we see people, they've, they, so the people that were in the stocks, they've gotten their profits and now they're selling. And the people who aren't in yet, they're probably thinking, okay, let me wait a bit, you know, um, to see if any other news comes out or, you know, for the prices to kind of drop to, you know, a more sensible level. So that's why we see that there's a, you know, there was a sharp um, spike upward. And then, you know, um, the, the, the subsequent days, we saw, you know, um, little, you know, very little changes in, in, you know, um, in the market. And May was uh, quite a bullish month for uh, the local boss. Um, what stocks are on your radar, you know, coming into June at this time? Are you expecting another bullish month for June? Um, in, in some areas, yes. Um, if you had asked me this question about three days ago, I would have said, oh, I'm definitely looking at oil and gas stocks. And we are still looking at oil and gas stocks, but um, a couple of them have already done really well. And um, we're kind of just waiting um, for them to come back down. Um, but we're also looking at consumer goods, you know, consumer goods stocks and, you know, industrial goods stocks. Because um, we're looking at the construction industry. Um, it's really been, um, it's been growing. Although GDP results, um, it's growing a little less this quarter than last quarter. Um, but construction has been growing. Um, accommodation has been growing. So we're looking into, you know, construction, you know, stocks that have, you know, industrial stocks, kind of like uh, your Dangote cement, your Boa cement, you know. Um, we know that consumer goods stocks also have their seasons. You know, and while we've kind of already been in the consumer goods season for quite a bit, um, um, I believe that there are still some, you know, some certain stocks that haven't, you know, yet moved with the market trend, with the consumer goods sector trend, you know, that still have a lot of potential, and, you know, and we're kind of watching them. And then, of course, you also have the financial space, which, you know, has always been a really great space. Um, 
Um, a lot of banking stocks, their yeah, Q1 results were really good. I believe Access Bank increased their profits after tax by about 23%. Um, so Access Bank's price you know, has been doing really well. Um, Fidelity too has been expanding. So we're kind of watching Fidelity, but we don't want to enter a lot. We don't really want to get in right now because, I mean, it's been trending upwards for like 10 months. Um, so we're kind of careful. But we're also watching, you know, stocks in the financial goods space, um, in industrial goods, and even some um, um, consumer goods um, um, companies. All right, we'll definitely be watching out for how uh, June uh, plays out in the local boss. Thank you so much, uh, Nasir Sote and Naholo, Investment Analyst, Main Street Capital Limited. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now let's um, head on to our next uh, conversation. Well, uh, planning uh, for uh, retirement is becoming quite a, a task. Uh, right now, uh, we see that uh, it's uh, getting harder with all the macroeconomic headwinds uh, we're seeing at this time, from inflation uh, to currencies uh, being pressured due to high um, debt level and all of that. So definitely setting out and setting aside uh, for retirement is um, quite tough now because you don't know uh, what investment class is going to still remain strong um, when you're um, ready to, uh, to, to retire at this time. So it's getting quite tough at this time. Let's talk to um, Abigail Utomi, now business head, asset management, um, Noren uh, Berger. Great to have you on the show. Good evening. Good evening, Ladi. Great to Great have to you. Have so uh, as I said, here. you said what? I said I'm happy to be here. Good oh, to see fantastic. You. Great to have you. Great to see you. And thank you for giving us your weekend. So definitely planning for uh, retirement seems to be tougher, you know, than before. Before, right now, we're dealing with geopolitics, inflation. Debt is changing the way we interact with, you know, most of these assets. There's pressure on currencies. And we see that the dollar is not left out. As some countries are planning to move away uh, from trading in, in the USD. How are you seeing, you know, all of this? Because at the end of the day, these assets are supposed to um, remain strong, you know, going forward. So if you're investing for retirement, you should be able to meet them strong when that time comes. Absolutely, Ladi. And um, all of these parameters that you've reeled out is the reason why we should continue to think critically about retirement planning the macroeconomic space and the local economy makes it quite challenging for the investment banking space and the investing public to cope with the fast movement, you know, in the variables and as such, making it more necessary for people to move and, you know, realign their investment objectives and their goals, as well as the objectives um, in terms of achieving them as quickly as possible. I mean, in Nigeria, for example, you're aware of all the latest developments after the change in government. And analyst opinion is that things would even get tougher. And of course, we all need to put our hands in the button and look at how best to do that. And for us here at Norin Berger Financial Group, we are always positioned you know, to meeting these needs and bridging this gap through our various uh, businesses within the group in pensions. So retirees need to start to look at the quality of their pension assets and how much, you know, the PFAs are able to maximize value from it. In addition to their own deliberate efforts to create semi-annuation funds for themselves ahead of retirement, because you really need to start to critically look at the numbers. Will it take you to where you want to be, you know, in the near or long, or to long term? If not, how best do you re-strategize to get there. You and I know that when you plan your finances well, your non-financial atmosphere looks a bit better because you have rest of mind, it reduces your stress, helps you live a healthier life, and of course, increases life expectancy ratio. So all of these things are things that, you know, we need to look at in order to help move us to where we need to be to grow the economy as a whole. And looking at, you know, investment classes at this time, which one do you think is that investment class that will stand the test of time, you know, the next uh, 20 years, still here, still has value? Of course, um, all market segments remains important, but I think that we really need to start to look at currency edge. And that's why uh, we launched a dollar fund last year to react to that change. Um, we need to also look at the 
fixed income space because, of course, as intending retirees or close to retirement, you need to start to seek for stable return on investment, and you would want to move away from highly volatile asset classes in equities. Now, depending on your age grade, you would be open to a more volatile investing up to a certain age where, of course, from an investment advisory perspective, we would begin to tell you to wind down and move away to safer assets that still pose great opportunities for growth, for periodic returns that you can plan with. Um, through retirement, because of course, you would not want your earnings to be impaired at such a short notice. You would want things to be stable to prevent reinvestment risk. No doubt, you would also need to hold a certain percentage of your funds in money market. The reason being that you would need to maintain liquidity and have some form of contingency fund in case of any um, emergency situation. Uh, that poses a very good plan for you to fall back to if the need arises. So investment portfolios would always be curated across asset classes and even currency divides. However, the proportion to which you would be looking at would depend on your age to retirement and your immediate short, medium and long term goals. Right. Well, we'll, we'll continue the conversation um, right after this break. Everyone's looking for that uh, you know, great hedge, you know, against uh, inflation. We still have um, Abigail Lutomi, Business Head, Asset Management, Norman Beja. We'll continue the conversation right after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Still watching Capital Market Live on Channels Television. I still have with me Abigail Lutomi, Business Head, Asset Management, uh, Norman Beja, and we'll be talking uh, retirement, planning for retirement, and the impact on the capital markets and economy. Um, thank you for staying with us. So, um, Abigail, what would you say is the best, you know, strategy to prepare for um, retirement for those far from retirement? Somebody like me, I feel like I'm far from retirement, but and those close to retirement, what's the best strategy? Okay, thank you, Ladi. Um, the best strategy would always be to start early. Um, from the first day you got your first paycheck, you should start to think about retirement because you need to realize that you won't work all your life. It is not healthy for right. you to continue to work hard, you know, all of, all of your life. Um, after that, you then need to look at your current and future um, positions. Where are you at, at the moment? What sort of future cash flows would you be having to take you to your destination? All of these realities needs to come into your objectives and they should be smarter ones. Um, you know what smarter stands for. And then after that, you need to look at the mechanism. How do you get there? Um, do you know what your risk profile is? How old are you? Um, what investment classes would you, or vehicles would you use to achieve those goals? Again, the reality would always come to play Things are changing really fast, like we discussed earlier. How quickly are you able or your portfolio able to react to those changes in the economy, um, as it were? And again, you then look at periodically how far you are from set targets and how you need to realign your portfolios to achieve that. A lot of people um, wake up and start to think about retirement planning too close to retirement. And of course, it creates um, some form of anxiety towards retirement that is absolutely unnecessary if we start early. Before retirement, you should already know whether you're going the pension, contribute uh, the program withdrawal route, or you're going annuity, not at retirement, right? Because whilst I would not put one over the other, each one would depend on the individual's objective, which way to go. And then understanding yourself in taking those decisions would help you determine ahead of time where you need to be rather than following the bandwagon. A lot of people follow others in retirement because they've never sat down to think about theirs. And then, of course, you need to start to look at what your pre-retirement lifestyle looks like. How do you want to sustain it at retirement? Do you want to scale down? Do you want to look at alternative ways to increase revenues through passive income, investment income, other business income if you do have one? Retirement is not the time to start to try new things. So if you have a passion, you should start it prior to retirement so you make the mistakes early and learn from them. If you haven't done it, please hold on and be 
Stay, be where you will be comfortable in and of course seek um, financial advice. The pension industry is small, small because um, we just have about 10% of the adult population at, uh, currently above 60 years of age. However, our youth population is a lot. Um, in this case, I'll be batching people from 18 to 60 years and we roughly have 46% of our population in that space. So you can reflect on how important this data is to the future. It therefore means that very soon we will find that the younger generation would be approaching retirement. How ready you know, are we to receive these numbers to that space? And how ready are they to be financially free um, at retirement? We are moving away from the traditional support system in Nigeria. And as such, people need to also start to shift in their planning towards that to ensure that okay. you know there is no breakdown and financial dependency at that time. All right, let's look at the you know pension um, industry now. How uh, how much uh, uh, benefit does it bring you know to the economy? And um, looking at you know government borrowing um, right now, we're seeing that definitely you know the government's definitely looking for revenue at this time, and even though. The government still likes to borrow at this time. How does this um, pension industry, you know, come into play with government borrowing and economic growth? Thank you, Ladi. Um, the pension industry is currently, what, 15.5 uh, trillion naira, um, accounts for approximately 8% of Nigeria GDP. The borrowing of the government supports um, as outlets for the pension funds because we're able to invest in some of those assets uh, across all funds. Uh, so I would say that it's a symbiotic ecosystem where one feeds the other and the other benefits from the other. However, the more we grow that industry, the more we increase our numbers. Currently, just about 10 million um, RSA holders out of the numbers reeled out earlier, we currently have about 45 million um, sorry, 45% of the population being in the youth population, which means that we still have about 90% that have not been included in the pension scheme. So the PFAs have a lot of work cut out for, for them. Um, Norenberger pensions, amongst others, you know, continue to seek ways to deepen the market, to increase uh, the reach and expand the, uh, the contribution of the pensions industry to Nigeria's GDP. Uh, we will also through deliberate steps in terms of uh, retirement planning seminars. And coincidentally, one is happening this month um, on the 23rd of June at the International Conference Center, which is also a means where the Nigerian public in Abuja and environs could come together once again to learn more about what they need to be doing ahead of retirement and also contribute their quota to the planning and strategy around it. Right, and, and definitely, um... 2023, we've seen the first quarter uh, quite tough, you know, at this time. What are you seeing for the um, pension industry um, going forward? It's going to be a very competitive one. Uh, people will start to look out for new markets, and rightly so, because there's still a lot more work that needs to be done, and we need to get out of the urban space rather than clustering there, whereas there are a lot of markets in the most informal segments of the economy, uh, so that needs to be banked. The micro pensions, which is the Fund 5, is growing, but it can grow faster than the pace we currently are seeing it. Uh, that will show us that a lot of the informal sector is beginning to embrace um, you know, pensions, financial sector, and financial literacy as a whole, because it's a way to plan in for retirement. And if you're already working in an informal sector where you're not sure of a compulsory contributory pension, then you just have to look for ways to create one for yourself to help protect you at retirement. Like I said earlier, people will not always be young and energetic and work all through their lives. So start to think about the future today. Right. Start to think about the future today. Thank you so much, uh, Abigail Utobi, Business Head, Asset Management, uh, Nuremberger. Thank you for coming on show today. Thank you for having me, Ladi. All right. So um, definitely, uh, it's the end of uh, this week. Now, looking forward to what happens next week in the local boss. Definitely, uh, some analysts are expecting a bullish trend to continue in the market. Hopefully, June stays uh, quite bullish.
uh, for the local boss. Well, join the same time um, next week. Don't forget, you can watch this again on our, our, our YouTube channel, Channel Television. Just search for Channel Television on YouTube, and you can follow us on other social media um, platforms to get more updates. I'm Ladi Williams. See you next week.